Alright, uh, anyone who's heard them sing about post quantum crypto? Um, first off, the line on. Uh, my name is Ash. I play them. I'm a CS major. Uh, I'm infatuated with Miatas. And uh, I use Artix with Waylands and I have a hobby. Oh, okay. So, first off, what is PQC? Uh, that's post quantum cryptography, and basically, it's cryptographic algorithms that like focus on like quantum attacks, like attacks from a quantum computer, and tries to make sure that they are secure against this. But when we do have big quantum computers that can run those algorithms, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so first off, we're going to talk about integer factorization, which is the basis of RSA. On a classical computer, it is highly, highly, highly inefficient. It runs in like exponential time, which is obnoxious. Um, basically, the best known strategy <laughs> for factoring a uh, semi prime number, which is uh, two prime numbers multiplied together, um, is just guessing um, with brute force. So you guess all the prime numbers from two up to the square root of the number that you're guessing, and then that's the best you can do. Um, now, Shor's algorithm is a lot more efficient when it's run on a quantum computer. You can technically run it on a classical computer, but it's still inefficient if you do that. Um, when you do run it on a quantum computer, it runs in, like, basically, log n time, which is very good. That's, like, faster than linear time, which is so sick and slide. Um, it can also be used to solve the discrete logarithm problem and a limited term discrete logarithm problem. So that covers RSA, Diffie Hellman, and elliptic curve cryptography. So, well, elliptic curve, Diffie Hellman. Uh, here's a complexity chart, and I know you guys love having complexities. Um, here we've got Troy's algorithm down here, and then like all the way over and up there, we've got. O to the two, um, two to the power of n, which is like classical methods for that thing. Uh, I'm gonna get a little bit into the weeds here, but not too much. Um, Shor's, alg <laughs> Shor's algorithm basically it takes a crappy guess that isn't probably a factor of n, the number you're trying to factor, and it raises it to some power r. Uh, it just multiplies that number a bunch of times until it becomes a factor of n. And then you can basically use um, a difference of squares, um, the a to the r over 2 minus 1 and plus 1, um, to factor n. And that works like 80% of the time. Uh, but the power that you're raising it to has to be even. Otherwise, you got to quit and try again. Um, so yeah, when you run Shor's algorithm like 10 times, then there's like a 90% chance that it'll be a over factor in RSA number. So yeah, it's pretty sick. Oh, let me talk a little bit as to why Shor's algorithm works on a quantum computer and less so on a classical computer. So basically what Shor's algorithm does is it takes like a bunch of different inputs and kind of inputs them all sort of at the same time into the quantum computer and then the quantum computer outputs like a frequency of as its answer and then you measure the frequency and then your frequency is going to be one over r that's the power you're looking for you can't really do that on a classical computer that's why you need a quantum computer for it Right, so there's a couple of issues with those out there because encryption isn't broken yet. Um, we can still use RSA, basically, theoretically, hopefully. Um, so the biggest problem is that there's a lack of qubits. Um, they try, I think it was IBM, I could be wrong about that, factored 21 in 15 inside. That is the biggest number we have factored so far with Shor's algorithm. On a quantum computer. Other numbers have been factored, um, bigger numbers, but they use a 
different method, which was not Shor's algorithm. They were basically getting the test. Um, they described the factor, 35. Um, but then it like broke. It like exploded. It, it did not explode. It did not explode. But it like aired out. Um, so the beta 2 is the lack of qubits. And then there's also like error accumulation, but if you have more qubits, then you can use those qubits to like check for errors, and then you don't have that issue anymore. So. All right, I'm going to briefly cover symmetric cryptography and like hashing. Um, basically, these are still safe. Um, our biggest issue is asymmetric cryptography. Um, <laughs> Grover's algorithm can be used to detect. Um, these two, but if you just increase the key sizes, then you'll be fine. Grover's algorithm is basically another quantum algorithm that is used to, um, like, take a black box function and reverse it. So you give it a bunch of inputs and a bunch of outputs, and then it tries to guess what the function is. Um, and it can do that in square root of n time, which is much faster than O of n time, which is what it is on on a computer, or on a classical computer. Um, but it's still, like, exponential. So it's not that big of a worry. It's faster, but it's not much faster. All right. Um, now into the, the big bit of this. Uh, NIST has a post-quantum cryptography competition because um, they're worried about Future cryptography. So they they basically asked a bunch of people to come up with algorithms that were going to be secure against quantum computers. Um, we're in round four right now. Um, so the contenders <laughs> are Byte, Classic Nucleus, and HPC. Psych is on there, um, but it was found to be insecure. It was actually attacked by a classical computer, and it was factored in like. I don't know, believe it, or it was crafted or believe that or something like that. It was really cool, but also not cool at the same time. Uh, so I'll talk about these a little bit more in a minute. Uh, but I want to cover lattice based cryptography first. Um, because these three up here were the winners of round three. So we've got Crystal Cyber, which is going to be like a replacement for RSA, sort of. And then crystal dilithium and Falcon, those are like digital signatures. Um, oopsies. Right, there we go. Okay. Crystal fiber is also used on top of uh, signals, um, electric current cryptography. So, yippee. Both of them, <laughs> both crystal fiber and dilithium use granular errors, which I will cover. A little, uh, I'll vaguely cover it in a little bit. And then Falcon uses uh, shorter signature solution and NTRU. NTRU is another algorithm um, that is based. What's that? Thank you. Uh, NTRU is a specific kind of lattice that is used in another cryptography scheme. Um, so this right here is a lattice. It's basically a collection of points. Um, and a lattice is described by basis vectors. So you can see B1 and B2, the long vectors. Um, those can be used to describe the lattice. Um, you can also have shorter and more perpendicular <laughs> um, vectors to describe the lattice, which is a better basis. So like, you can have those two as a basis vector, um, which makes finding point T a lot easier because it's just two of those vectors. Um, finding point T is a lot harder with B1 and B2 because you have to add up a bunch of them to get to the closest lattice point. Um, this could be found in a reasonable amount of time on like, in like two dimensions. But if you use like higher dimension lattice, then it becomes a lot harder. So that's the basis of 
most lattice-based problems. Uh, learning with errors can be reduced to this. Basically, you have a bunch of um, equations, and then you add a little bit of error, like plus or minus one, two, three, so on and so forth. Um, and then it's hard to reverse that, but if you have the original equations, then it's much easier to find out what the data point is. Right, okay. Uh, other cryptography schemes that are being tested right now, um, we've got a lot of code-based ones. Um, so classic McLeese has actually been around for like four years or something like that, and it hasn't been broken yet. Um, the reason why we don't use it is because it's obnoxiously big. It has like really big pieces. Um, if you look here, the public key is like one megabyte, and then the private key is like 11.5 kilobytes, which is ridiculous because it's like bytes big or like Diffie Hellman and elliptic curves. Um, yeah. Classic McLeese uses Gopher codes, which is basically just a sort of mathematical function um, that's hard to reverse. Um, that's what all of these basically use. Um, bike is bit clipping key encapsulation. And then HQC is Hamming code, quasi cyclic. Uh, yeah. Hamming codes are actually pretty interesting. I recommend looking into them. Uh, they're used for error correction. Yeah. Uh, multivariate cryptography. Uh, the biggest one that I could think of is Rainbow that uses like an unbalanced oil and vinegar scheme. Um, but I don't think that's entirely secure, or at least there were attacks found that made it less secure than they originally claimed. So wouldn't really recommend using that one. Uh, there's also hash-based algorithms. Um, these take uh, hash and use that as its capital function. So there's Sphinx, which is notable because it's um, it's stateless, so it doesn't have to remember all the keys that it's used before. Um, most other hash-based algorithms are stateful, and they have to remember all of the keys that they've used before, so that way they don't get reused. Um, VPQS, that's specifically um, being looked into for like cryptocurrency, uh, for blockchain. Um, that actually stands for blockchain quantum system or something like that. I don't quite remember. And then there's isogeny. Um, so there's two. Uh, SIDH, that's just a derivative of psych. Um, it's just using slightly different parameters. Uh, psych is super singular iso isogeny P extreme. And SIDH is super singular isogeny P on it. Basically, what it does is it takes an elliptic curve, which has like unique tangent lines on every point. Um, that's the super singular bit. And then it takes an isogeny of that elliptic curve, which is basically a fancy way of saying a mapping from one curve to another. Um, and then it uses that for its encryption. That's all I have for today. Any, any questions? What's up, James Ben? Um, Crystal Skyver is probably like objectively the best one because it's got smaller key sizes than like some of the code based ones. And yeah. However, there have been a couple of like there's been research into it that show that it may not be as secure as it was originally thought, but they modified it so that hopefully those concerns are mitigated. Yeah. Any other questions? What's up? How long do you think RSA will last before it's to be more than 
So there's a lot of different estimates. Um, some people say five years. Other people say 30 years. Um, other people still think we won't be able to build a big enough uh, quantum computer. So it really depends. Um, most people, like middling people, are like saying 20 years, maybe. Yeah. Any other questions? What's that time? I don't know if I want to answer that. Um, Can we repeat the question? Right, okay, okay. So hypothetically, if you had, I don't remember the, all the words you used, if you had a small device that you could store all of these small key sizes in a, in, using hardware, <laughs> that uses a sequence of bit books to store this data. In a small form factor. In a small form factor. Platform that is moderately safe depending on where you store it. What would that be? I will also note this is a branded device that's also orange. It's a branded device that's also orange. Well, I can only think of one small hardware um, branded device that's also orange. I'm thinking of a, I'm thinking of a flash drive or a USB. Oh, let's go.